that's a great question. You, you know, um, one of the important things to mention is that I did not start out my life in the meditation or mindfulness world. I actually started out my professional life as a cognitive therapist working in the area of mood disorders. And so uh, at the time, the big puzzle in mood disorders was how to help people stay well, because there were good treatments that were available. There were antidepressants, there was cognitive therapy, but there were still high rates of relapse. And so I received some funding to try to develop a relapse prevention treatment that could be offered to people in recovery. And this was a real puzzle because treating people in recovery is very unusual. People feel well, so maybe they're asking questions, why do I need to be treated? And also the phenomenological states of mind are not as disturbing as people who are carrying severe depressive symptoms. And so I used that money to bring together Mark, T uh, Mark Williams and John Teasdale to talk about what a treatment for people in recovery from depression looking to prevent relapse um, could be. And we were very convinced at that time that decentering or the ability to have metacognitive awareness of experience, to observe and not to be identified with experience, would be very, very helpful. And this was already a feature that was talked about in cognitive therapy and in all psychotherapies. But we found out that mindfulness meditation is a way of training this particularly well and particularly directly. And so really, MBCT was founded as a way of helping people to learn decentering skills to allow them to relate differently to their thoughts, to their emotions, and to their physical sensations in a way that could help them stay well and prevent a kind of ruminative buildup that might lead them to develop further depressive symptoms. How does MBCT work with negative emotions? This is, a, this is a big question, but I think in many ways it's right at the heart of MBCT. A lot of the emotion regulation strategies that we find in psychotherapy emphasize um, reappraisal, ways of cognitively transforming the nature of the experience of an emotion, um, looking at different contexts, um, relating to thoughts at least as um, ways of thinking that can be helpful or not helpful, uh, evaluating the pros and cons of certain thought processes. Um, MBCT takes a very, very different approach. And let me say from the beginning, it's not that there's one way that's better than the other. It's possible that when people are in an acute episode of depression or an acute phase of anxiety, certain strategies like distraction, um, attenuation of affect uh, might be helpful because as people can reduce the intensity of affect, they might be able to better engage in behavioral activation or routines that allow them to test out beliefs or to approach situations that they might be avoiding. But once again, we have to remember that the context of work for MBCT are for people who are in recovery or at least have some mild residual symptoms but are no longer right in the, uh, the real strong grip of severe symptoms. And so, if I could summarize what the approach of affect regulation is in MBCT, it's to help people to befriend and to investigate with kindness their moments of affective experience. And this is a very difficult thing to convey to people because it seems like the exact opposite that people would want to do. Why would I want to befriend my judgment? Why would I want to befriend my sense of inadequacy? Why would I want to befriend my sense of being rejected and hurt? But really inside of that is the possibility that we can allow these affects to exist in an attentional space and at the same time develop a different relationship to them, one that doesn't require that they be eliminated for us to be happy, one that does not require that they be transformed or that we need to be fixed in some way for us to be whole. And MBCT, through the practice of mindfulness meditation, 
through the use of um, exercises and other ways of allowing affect to um, exist in this larger attentional space created by um, mindfulness meditation allows us to experiment with and to work with these different alternative modes of affect regulation, including a very important point, which is when we speak about affect, the place where we usually start is right in the body. Instead of looking at thoughts, we look at sensations in the body and then work our way outwards from that. The future of MBCT, I think, is very um, bright and at the same time somewhat challenging. Um, we've conducted a lot of research to help build the evidence base for MBCT. You have to remember when we started, when Mark and John and I started to uh, develop MBCT, we were working in fairly conservative institutions, departments of psychiatry, um, cognitive research laboratories. And so to suggest that we can help people who have a mood disorder by teaching them how to practice mindfulness meditation was something that was outrageous at the time. And so the way that we helped people consider this um, was to develop and gather evidence. And so a lot of the early work in MBCT was to generate evidence and data from randomized clinical trials to show that there is a distinctive benefit for patients who participate. And not just a benefit from being an MBCT group, but that the benefit is on par with what people receive if they're on an antidepressant or if they're accessing other ways of preventing relapse. But I think that these days, if I'm being honest, the need for further evidence is a little bit less important than the need for dissemination to help people get this into the hands of those that are dealing with a mood disorder, the prevalence of mood disorders is so great. People who recover, looking to stay well, need to access this care. And at this point, it's really not happening. MBCT is offered by very few people, even in large cities in North America, um, a little bit in Europe. And our, I think, um, goal in the next years or so is to help influence its dissemination in a much broader way. Um, and so one of the ways that we've done that is to develop an online platform where people can access MBCT. And the other dissemination um, innovation, I think, is to help MBCT be delivered in an individual therapy, whether that's in the context of an individual therapist working with a client to deliver the eight-week program or to take pieces of the program out and to adapt it based on patient uh, that they're sitting with. So maybe to teach the three-minute breathing space. It doesn't have to be the whole program. But there are ways of adapting this in the context of individual therapy, which I think would still serve the bigger purpose of um, making this model more available and getting it into more people's hands.